Well, great. It's great to be here this morning and to see so many of you guys here. I, um, I wish you all the best of luck today in your competitions. And Emily asked me to talk a little bit about the work that I do um, up in the Arctic. And, you know, like a lot of you guys, I was really interested in math and science when I was uh, a high school student. So it was kind of a given that I would be doing something in that field at some point in my life. And I started out in aerospace engineering, actually, and thought I was going to be an astronaut. And uh, discovered I actually suffer from motion sickness, so I wasn't going to be an astronaut anytime soon. And then during my master's in engineering, I went and started focusing more on ocean modeling and, and looking at El Nino and La Nina events. But I wasn't, still didn't really motivate me too much. And then during the, at the end of my master's, I took this class, this physical climatology class in the geography department. And my professor that I had, he was, um, he showed a lot of pictures of all the places he goes and does field work. He did a lot of field work up in Tibet, in the Alps, and also in Greenland. And when I saw the pictures of Greenland, I just thought, you know what, I need to go there. You know, I, I want to go see this, this magnificent place. So I um, switched over for my PhD from engineering and went to the geography department. And I got to go to Greenland my first time when I was 28 to do field work. And coming from the engineering department, and especially in aerospace, I was um, focused mostly on working with satellite data. So monitoring places like Greenland using satellite data because it's really hard to get to places like Greenland. They're remote um, for a large part of the year. It's dark. There's no sun. It's very cold. So we do a lot of stuff with satellites, but we also spend a lot of time going in the field because whenever you're working with like satellite data, you want to make sure that what you're doing is actually realistic and valid. And so if you're trying to derive different geophysical parameters from satellite data, you need to do some field work to just test and, you know, make sure that what you're doing is accurate. So I've been fortunate enough now to, um, at least in the early part of my career, I spent three different summers in Greenland, ground truthing a lot of the work that I was doing with satellite data, and getting to just experience such a magnificent place like the Greenland ice sheet. And this was my last time actually up in Greenland, which was about, I guess it was about four summers ago, where we were actually on this case, field experiment, we were actually going out and measuring how much water was coming off the glaciers, how much melt was coming off of the glacier during the summer melt season. So the beginning of my career, I really spent the time trying to understand better the energy and the mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet. Because as some of you may know, you know, when we're looking at future projections of sea level rise, we're really concerned as to what's going to be happening to the large ice sheets, the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet. And so um, using satellite data, I was looking at, you know, what are the different um, mechanisms controlling changes in the mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet? And one of the things that I was looking at was, you know, how well can we monitor things like changes in the surface albedo of the ice sheet or the changes in the reflectivity of the ice sheet, which really governs how much of the sun's energy is absorbed by the ice um, versus how much is reflected at back out to space. So because snow is very bright, it reflects most of the incoming solar radiation from the sun back out to space. But if it starts to melt, it lowers the albedo and more of that sun's energy is absorbed, which causes more melt on the ice sheet, which could allow more of the fresh water from the ice sheet to run off into the ocean. And so this is just an example of the mean sort of summertime albedo for the Greenland ice sheet, showing that large parts of it are very high, around 0.8. So it reflects 80% of the sun's energy back out to space. But in the coastal regions where you tend to get melt in the summertime, the albedo is much lower. And so trying to monitor these changes over time is really important when we're trying to look at you know, what's going to happen to the Greenland ice sheet in the future as the planet <coughs> continues to warm. And so we do know that places like Greenland are responding to warming in the last few years. Um, this is an example of just sort of the overall kind of melting. Um, it's a melt index for the Greenland ice sheet show going back to 1979. So in, that in the earlier years, the anomalies are negative, but in the last few years, there's been a lot more melt happening over the ice sheet. And in 2012, we set a new record in terms of how much of the ice sheet experienced melt in, during the summertime. And it actually extended up to the highest elevation of the ice sheet, where typically we don't get any melting happening. And this big melt event actually caused um, a lot of discharge coming off of the ice sheet, a lot of meltwater. There was a bridge in southern Greenland sort of right around here. That had been um, constructed back in the 1930s um, by the US military that was completely washed out this summer as the rush of um, floodwaters just completely wiped out that whole region. 
we do know that you know, Greenland is very important when we're looking at future projections of sea level rise in the ocean because if you were to melt the entire ice sheet, you would raise global sea level by about 7 meters or 23 feet. And in the 1990s, we knew that Greenland contributed about, you know, about 0.13 millimeters per year to the global sea level rise. But this has accelerated in recent years, and part of it is a result to speeding up of some of the outlet glaciers <coughs> that dump their ice um, into the ocean. And the fastest moving discharge glacier, um, probably one of the fastest ones in the world, is the Jakobshavn Isbre, um, which is shown here. And we can look at different progressions of the grounding line. You know, where the ice used to um, terminate into the ocean back in the 1800s and where it's terminating today. This glacier moves at about 7 kilometers per year, and it's starting to dump a lot more of the ice from Greenland into the ocean. And because of that, the, right now today's estimate of how much Greenland is contributing to global sea level is about 0.7 millimeters per year. And so scientists are really trying to better understand, you know, what's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen as we continue to warm, are a lot of these um, glaciers going to start to speed up even more and dump more and more fresh water um, into the ocean and continue to raise uh, sea levels? So this is what I did kind of in the early part of my career. But then the last several years, I've been actually spending more time focusing on the sea ice. And so sea ice is different than, than glacier ice in that it actually forms in the ocean. And different than like if we're looking at changes in sea level, for example, changes in the floating cover of the ocean sea ice is not going to necessarily change sea level. So if we melt the sea ice, it doesn't change sea level. Because this ice forms in the ocean, it's like an ice cube in a glass of water. If you melt that ice cube, you're not going to be raising sea level. But it is very important in terms of ocean circulation, in terms of um, regulating the amount of heat that's up in the Arctic. And so I've been spending probably about I guess about 10 years now, just focus on changes that are going on in the Arctic sea ice, because in a lot of ways, the sea ice has become our poster child now for um, climate change, because we're seeing really dramatic changes in the sea ice cover. And this, uh, these pictures are actually from uh, being up in the Arctic this last summer on an icebreaker. And the amazing thing when you get to go out on sea ice like that is you get to watch wildlife. And we were able to see quite a few polar bears. And this was a a mom with her cub, which was about maybe a two-year-old cub, and they were trying to get across the ice. And they're very curious. They're always coming up to you. So I've also been um, spending quite a bit of time now on the sea ice doing various measurements. And again, a lot of what I'm doing when I'm out there is to sort of validate what I'm doing from satellite, because most of my work does involve satellite data. Because with satellites, I can monitor changes that are happening in the Arctic Ocean over you know, large spatial scales and consistently from, you know, day to day, where it's a little bit harder when you're out there just, you know, on an icebreaker, for example. You get a very limited perspective of what's going on. Um, just to be clear, though, because I see this a lot in media and it gets a little frustrating when they do stories about what's happening to the sea ice, they show pictures of icebergs. These are not the same thing. Icebergs come form on land and sea ice forms in the ocean. So. This is not sea ice, and, is, and when we talk about changes in sea ice, we're not really take, talking about them, the impacts on sea level, which I think a lot of people get confused about. Um, so it's probably important to understand that there is a lot of variability in, in the Arctic sea ice cover. And in wintertime, it extends about 14 to 16 million square kilometers. And it, it grows pretty far south. I mean, we're looking here off the coast of Newfoundland where you'll get some sea ice forming. This is Hudson Bay. You got the Sea of Akash from Japan. But you know, most of the Arctic um, is covered by ice. If we look at the entire Arctic Ocean, it is covered by sea ice in the wintertime. And typically, the Arctic Ocean is also covered by sea ice in the summer as well. But it, it's much smaller than it is in winter, because as the temperatures warm up and the sun comes back, it does melt all around the edges of the ice sheet. You lose the ice in Hudson Bay. So all of the, sort of the marginal ice seas lose their sea ice cover in the summertime. And we shrink to about 7 million square kilometers. But the last, I guess about, well actually, actually the last five decades, although this is going to show it from 79 from satellite, we're starting to lose that summer sea ice cover. And so this is an animation showing the extent of the summer sea ice cover um, in the Arctic, so during September. And we can watch how it's been changing over time. And you can see that 
you know, in the 90s, I mean, in the 70s, it was around 6 to 7 million square kilometers, and it was dropping kind of steadily through the 90s. But then the last several years, it has plummeted compared to what we typically saw in the 1970s and 1980s. And we actually have about 40% of the Arctic Ocean today is covered by sea ice compared to what it was 30 to 40 years ago. And what's interesting, too, and what we're seeing, so, I mean, here's Alaska, and here's Siberia and Eurasia. I mean, all of these regions that used to be covered by sea ice in the summers, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, are now, it's open water. And so this changes a lot of things in the Arctic um, in terms of, one, now instead of the, the ice now reflecting a lot of the sun's energy back out to space, now the ocean's absorbing all of that sun's energy, and it's warming up. You also can look at, wow, all of a sudden you have all this open water here, now ships can get through these regions that used to be choked with ice, and that's definitely changing a lot of the marine traffic that we see in the Arctic, which I'll show in a minute as well. We do know that if we continue to keep warming the planet more, and we look at our climate model simulations, all of these models show that at some point in the near future, we're going to lose that summer ice cover. We're going to have an Arctic Ocean that is completely ice-free in summers. It'll still come back in the wintertime. It'll still be cold enough for that, but we're going to lose it in the summers. And this is actually kind of not showing up too well on the screen, but I'm just looking at two different sort of future projections of what could happen um, as we continue to in increase the amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. If we sort of do a, a little bit of a mitigation scenario where the radiative forcing at the end of this century is about 4.5 watts per meter squared, which is by the blue line. The um, red line is showing if we do a more aggressive sort of emission scenario where we keep putting a lot more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the radiative forcing at the end of the century is about 8.5 watts per meter squared. You know, we're, we're looking at changes in this, um, we're looking at dates of when the Arctic might go ice free sometime before the end of this century. What I find interesting though when we look at these projections of what's happening and we look at where the observations are, we're sort of at this extremer end of, of what these models are telling us. So when we look at sort of future dates as to when the Arctic Ocean might lose its summer ice, it may happen sooner than a lot of our models are able to forecast because we're noticing that the rate of ice loss that we're seeing today is faster than a lot of our models can capture. And, you know, why this is important is, you know, it really has to do a lot with that ice albedo feedback because snow and ice help regulate the temperature on the planet. It keeps the planet cooler. It reflects a lot of the sun's energy back out to space. So if you remove that reflective cover, you remove that snow and you remove the ice, the land is going to warm up, the oceans are going to warm up, and that's going to further accelerate the warming that we're seeing um, happening already today. And so when you look at projections of what's going to happen in the future, and we look at the warming patterns, and this was um, some projections, um, climate models from um, about, I guess about five years ago now, these, these projections were. And we look at sort of this global mean warming of about three degrees Celsius um, for the planet by 2100, and you look at the land areas, they tend to warm faster than the ocean areas, but you look at the Arctic, and you see that this region up here is projected to warm by about seven degrees at the end of the century. And this is really tied to that ice albedo feedback that helps keep our planet cool. So when you take away the snow and ice up in the Arctic, that part of the world is going to warm up even faster than anything that we see down here, for example, in Colorado or the lower latitudes. And one of the things that we're already seeing, the impact of this warming, is that coastal communities in the Arctic, for example, that um, were built on frozen land, so the permafrost was, was frozen and starting to thaw a bit more. But also because you're losing the sea ice, you're actually having a larger fetch. So the amount of open water surrounding the coastlines has increased, and so that exposes these coastal regions to large storms and waves from those storms that then can cause these entire villages to start falling off into the ocean. And a lot of these coastal communities are actually having to move now in the Arctic because they are um, they're basically falling off into the sea. And of course, if we look at these future projections of sea ice, it's also going to have a huge impact on the biology in the Arctic. Because if you think about you know, the phytoplankton, which is tied to the timing of the sea ice formation and when, it and when it goes away, which then feeds the fish, which feed the seals, which feed the bears, all of the life cycles of these species up in the Arctic are really tied to when the ice forms and when it retreats. And so when we're looking at changes in the sea ice cover, it's going to impact a lot on the wildlife up in the Arctic. And it's really, it's hard to imagine that polar bears, for example, would be able to 
survive in their numbers today if they no longer have the sea ice to hunt their favorite food, which are the seals. And if they're then stranded on land and can't eat, that definitely affects also their ability to reproduce. And they've noticed in places like Hudson Bay that a lot of these bears are actually struggling in their reproductive cycle because they don't feed as long as they used to. We also know that because of the, um, the sea ice disappearing, a lot of these shipping routes are starting to open up. So we look at places like the Northwest Passage through the Canadian archipelago. That sea route's been open the last five years, about last five summers. So ships have been able to get through that passageway. The same is true over on the Eurasian side. The Northern Sea Route has also been open over the last several years. And this is actually increasing a lot of the marine traffic, a lot of the ship traffic in the Arctic has increased because of this. We can look at just even changes in the last three years in the Northern Sea Route in 2010, you had four ships that went through the Northern Sea Route. In 2012, you had 49 ships. And most of these ships are actually carrying um, fuel, so oil and gas is what they're carrying between Asia and Russia, is where a lot of these tankers were. So this is going to have a huge impact on the marine environment in the Arctic as well. And it's a little hard to get sort of updates on what's going on with how many ships are up there right now. But just to give you an idea of where a lot of the shipping activity is in the Arctic, we, there's a lot of it related to mineral extraction. So there's places in um, the Bering Sea and Baffin Bay off the coast of Greenland, and also along um, the Eurasian sector where they're doing a lot of mining activity. There's also really a large increase in marine tourism in the Arctic. So cruise ships that are going around Iceland, they're going around Svalbard, Greenland. Um, there's a lot of major fisheries, of course, in the Arctic as well. The Bering Sea and the Barents Sea are really large um, fishery areas. There's also the Norwegian Seas. There's also now an, a huge increase in oil and gas, and there's a lot of interest by the um, oil and gas companies to do more drilling up in the Arctic. And I don't know if you've heard a lot about what Shell tried to do some drilling off the Chukchi Sea this last summer, but they had some issues um, with their rigs. There's also summer sea lift operations. And of course, a lot of science that's being done in the Arctic. So there's a lot of ships right now up in the Arctic Ocean. And in 2004, there was, a, there was more than um, 5,500 ships that they saw already up in the Arctic doing research, doing mineral extraction, um, transporting goods. And we don't know what the number is right now, but it's probably increased um, quite a bit. So finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how these changes that we're seeing in the Arctic might impact the rest of us in terms of changes in weather and the whole hydrological cycle. We do know that the loss of sea ice is going to increase the warming that we're seeing up in the Arctic because before the ice can form again in winter, the ocean's going to have to release all that heat it gained during the summertime in order for the ice to form again. So we can look at changes in temperature, for example, in the Arctic. And this is just an example. We call this a Hov-Mahler plot, where we have year on the um, x-axis and month on the y-axis. And this is looking at temperature anomalies. And if we just look at the last decade, we can see that the Arctic, it's been warmer than it used to be. So that's part of, I think, what's contributing to the loss of the sea ice. But the warming tends to be more amplified in the autumn and in the winter seasons when the ocean's releasing the heat that it gained back to space, back to the atmosphere. And this has an impact on our weather patterns because the temperature difference between the equator and the poles drives much of our atmospheric circulation. It also drives a lot of our oceanic circulation. But this pressure difference that sets up because of a temperature difference also drives a lot of our winds and it controls the speed of a lot of our large scale atmospheric circulation patterns, things like the jet stream. So if you change that temperature gradient, we've actually been starting to notice that there's been a slowing down of a jet stream. And some recent work has suggested that these changes in the jet stream that could be uh, related to the changes in the um, temperature difference between the Arctic and the equator could allow more extreme conditions to persist longer. So things like droughts and floods um, and heat waves. And so this is a lot of where the science is trying to focus right now, is trying to understand, OK, we're gonna, we're, we all pretty much agree that, yes, we're probably going to lose the sea ice cover in the Arctic Ocean in the summertime. So what does it mean for the rest of us? And, and can we better understand these extreme weather events that we've been experiencing more often? A good example of um, sort of a, interaction between what's going on in the Arctic and what's going on, say, in the tropics was the, um, I guess they called it the Snowmageddon in uh, winter 2009 and 2010, which dumped a bunch of snow on the East Coast. And what you had is you had a very strong El Nino that brought up a lot of warm air from the Pacific, a lot of warm, moist air in the Pacific that then interacted with this cold front that was coming down from the Arctic because we had a very unusual pressure pattern in the Arctic 
where this sea level pressure was higher than normal and it allowed these cold air outbreaks to come down from the Arctic and interact with that warm Pacific flow coming up from the El Nino and dumped a bunch of snow on, um, on the East Coast. And a lot of models have suggested that as you lose the sea ice in the summer times, that pressure pattern of when you get this strong sort of negative Arctic oscillation mode in the Arctic, that should become more frequent as we lose the sea ice. So then if you have a strong El Nino event like we had that a couple years ago, that could then allow for these larger storms to happen, or larger um, snowfall events to happen. So just to conclude, um, we know that many components of the Arctic are going large, undergoing large changes right now. And a lot of these changes that we're seeing in the Arctic are consistent with what our climate models have been forecasting is going to happen if we keep putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. What is a, more, a little bit scary, though, I guess, is that some of these um, changes that we're seeing, like the loss of the floating sea ice cover, these changes are happening faster than a lot of our models are capturing. So even when we look at the, sort of the extreme end of these forecasts um, of when ice-free conditions may happen, it may happen even sooner. And a lot of us think it'll probably happen sometime before 2050, where the majority of the Arctic Ocean will be ice-free in the summer times. We know that these changes in the Arctic are already affecting uh, many different systems, the environmental, the biological, and the societal systems in the Arctic. And we do understand that the changes that are happening in the Arctic are likely also not just going to impact the Arctic, but they're also going to impact the lower latitudes and impact um, us as well. Because we do know that everything is interconnected, and if you change one part of the planet and you change the whole energy balance of, say, the Arctic, it's going to impact everything else. It's going to change our ocean circulation. It's going to change our atmospheric circulation. And that's what we're really trying to understand now, is, is what are the implications for the rest of us? Okay, I guess that's all I have. And, um,